Hi, welcome back to the final presentation for OCR Biology Module 2. Uh, this is on animal and plant cells and tissues. Uh, let's look at this areas of specification we're going to cover today. Uh, we're thinking about um, how cells are specialised for particular functions, uh, how cells are organised into tissues, organs and organ systems, and then some specific examples of certain types of tissue and cell. Uh, erythrocytes and neutrophils we'll look at. Uh, we'll look at epithelia, which is not mentioned there, but it's the most common type of uh, tissues. And we'll look at different plant uh, animal tissues as well as plant tissues. And also then production of xylem and phloem. So differentiation, in other words, producing different kinds of cell. Yeah? So differentiation refers to uh, the cells in a multicellular organism, in other words, cells which are made up of lot organisms which are made up of lots of cells, they need to have specialisms or different functions. And they can differentiate by having different numbers of a particular organelle. So for example, if it's a cell that's particularly active, they might have lots of mitochondria, um, different shapes, specialized shapes to perform a particular function, for example, highly folded to give a large surface area. Remember that's your default biology answer. Uh, and the contents of the cell. So um, specific specialised cells. In a single celled organism, if you think about it, it's got to do everything for that particular organism. So it needs to be adapted to do everything. If you've got larger multicellular organisms, then it needs to have certain types of cell to do certain functions. Um, and it you know it helps you to think about it if we've got a large block of cells you've got to be able to have some kind of adaptation to get materials into the middle so that all cells get the oxygen and the glucose that they need for respiration and are able to remove waste uh, and we call that specialism yeah so um here's an example of three cells think about one to two to three centimeters squared this larger sort of cell, if you'd imagine here, it's very difficult for something to be able to diffuse all the way in. And that's to do with something called the surface area to volume ratio. Yeah, there's some a little bit of maths to work this out, but basically this has got a smaller ratio of surface area comparison to volume. Uh, so it makes it, uh, the bigger an organism is, the more difficult it is for substances to get into it. So therefore, they start to need to have specialism. Yeah? The smaller an organism is, the less likely it is to need specialism. Uh, so um, in humans, we have over 200 different types of cell. Uh, and one particular type of uh, cell we, and sort of tissue we're going to think about is epithelia. Now, um, epithelia are lining tissues, and we'll look at those more in a little bit in a moment. Um, tissues are groups of cells that perform a similar function and often an epithelia is made up of very similar epithelial cells uh, and they line this inner and outer surfaces of the body. Organs, uh, for example, uh, the intestine is an example of an organ, uh, consists of multiple different types of tissue, uh, epithelia, muscle and connective tissue, and we'll look at all of those in more detail. Um, Organ systems, the digestive system is a classic example of an organ system, which you know, I have small and large intestine, uh, plus stomach, etc, etc. And obviously, the human as an entire organism are made up of multiple organ systems, which contain different, uh, uh, different functions. Yeah, now, don't forget that we, this can apply to all types of organism. Uh, we often focus on humans, but we can also think about plants, and we'll look at plants in some detail in a moment. So uh, here's an example of a specialised cell, uh, the sperm cell. Um, it's probably a good idea to pause the video at this point uh, and just have a think about how it's specialised in particular functions. There's some clues in the diagram before you continue on to listen to the rest of the presentation. So pause for a moment. And you're back in the room. So let's have a look. Um, Obviously, we've got the mitochondria here. The mitochondria are present um, because the sperm cell requires a lot of energy. So it's a lot of concentration of mitochondria in the middle piece of the sp uh, sperm cell. Um, the tail or undulopodia is there to beat backwards and forwards. Um, and that's a shape adaptation. Um, in terms of the head of the sperm cell, it's got this acrosome, which is a sort of adapted lysosome. It's there so it can release the enzymes in, and drill its way through the egg cell to get to the nucleus, because remember the nucleus of this has got to fuse with the nucleus of the egg cell. 
uh, and it's specialized because this nucleus only has half the number of chromosomes uh, that a normal cell would have. Ah, so it referred the specification to erythrocytes and neutrophils. You'd better know erythrocytes as red blood cells. Yeah, erythrocytes uh, literally means a red blood cell. Erythro is red, site, cell. So uh, erythrocytes are red blood cells, and neutrophils are an example of one of the types of white blood cells. There are lots of different types of white blood cells. We're just going to focus on neutrophils for today. Uh, you'll do more work on uh, different types of white blood cells when we think about uh, diseases and so on. But both red blood cells and white blood cells come from stem cells in the bone marrow, in other words, cells which differentiate and produce particular types of cells. They have very different uh, structures and roles. Erythrocytes, um, as a red blood cell, they don't have a nucleus. They lose their nucleus during development and they don't have mitochondria or Golgi body or endoplasmic reticulum either. So when you consider what you would typically consider to be an animal cell, they don't have a lot of those features. Um, they are, however, um, adapted to cram in as much hemoglobin for carrying oxygen as possible. So they're biconcave. That means they cave in on both sides. They curve in on both sides. Uh, and that allows uh, a larger surface area to volume ratio, which means it's easier to offer oxygen to diffuse in and back out again um, so that it can bind with the hemoglobin. Uh, the cell shape, shape is also flexible and allows it to fit through very small and narrow capillaries. Remember, capillary is literally almost one red blood cell sort of wide to allow yeah, the, the movement of red blood cells and the red blood cells have got to flex in between there. Neutrophils, much larger. Um, they have what we call a multi-lobular nucleus. Um, in other words, they've got a nucleus made of several lobes. You can see one, two, three. Uh, it's one of the diagnostic ways of being able to identify them as a neutrophil because they have uh, a nucleus that is divided to lobes rather than a larger nucleus which fills the cell, which would be a lymphocyte. Uh, and then they were described as having a very granular cytoplasm, and that's because the granules are actually lots of lysosomes. Remember, neutrophils, one of their jobs often is to um, break down and engulf um, foreign bodies, uh, so invading bacteria. So if you think about it, if they're packed full of lysosomes, that allows them to do their phagocytosis function. Yeah, they can digest and break down lots of uh, uh, invading organisms if they've got lots of lysosomes to do so. So hence their particular adaptation. Yeah, and also they're flexible as well. They've got to be able to uh, produce pseudopodia and engulf things. So therefore they need to be flexible and be able to change shape. Squamous epithelia uh, are flat, thin cells. So it's a very thin sort of layer of cells, sometimes described as pavement epithelia because they've got this classic sort of crazy paving kind of shape. Um, the alveoli is lined with uh, squamous epithelia. Um, they are joined sort of by their cell membrane and there's an underlying what we call basal membrane. We'll look at that in a bit in a moment. Um, ciliated epithelia similar sort of in that there's one layer of epithelial cell uh, but they've got hair-like cilia remember they're not hairs they are hair-like cilia which can waft backwards and forwards and move substances around classically found in the lungs but they're also found in the um, after my mental block fallopian tubes uh, they are found in the fallopian tubes uh, to waft the egg along as well uh, let's move on to thinking about different types of tissue. We've mentioned two types of epithelia, and epithelial tissue is one of the other four main types of tissue, along with connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Uh, and we'll look at each of these in more detail. Epithelial tissue. Um, remember, a tissue is a group of cells performing a similar function, and there are two key types of uh, epithelia. You've got simple epithelia, in other words, a single layer of uh, cells thick. And then you've got stratified epithelia, multiple layers. So this is a simple epithelia and this is stratified epithelia. Um, uh, but principally all epithelial tissue is either lining external surfaces, like skin, or internal surfaces. So it lines your in, uh, digestive tract, for example. Yeah? Uh, and it can be one or so let's say one layer of cells thick or multiple layers of cells thick. But it's still lining tissue. Connective tissue. Um, as you would imagine, helps to bind together and connect the whole body. Um, and But it, it's a bit broader than that um, because connective tissue 
has a lot of interconnected materials without necessarily having lots of cells. So blood is an example of part of connective tissue uh, because the plasma, the liquid component, uh, and the blood together make a connective tissue. Similarly, bone and cartilage are connective tissues, uh, as well as there's sort of a um, sort of loose connective tissue that kind of binds and everything together and fits in between the, the, the tissues. So there's quite a lot of connective tissue that makes up the body. You know, you've got collagen, elastic fibres and so on. So connective tissue is very important. We're we'll able to move without it. We're we'll able to move without this either. Muscle tissue. Uh, three main types. You've got smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the classic muscle you would think about when joining both one bone to another. But you also have cardiac muscle, which can uh, beat for the entirety of an organism's lifespan, and smooth muscle, which makes up body organs like the digestive system, yeah, or a large portion of the digestive system made of smoothness. Nervous tissue, um, neurons, obviously, to allow you to respond to stimuli. Remember, you've got uh, sensory and motor neurons sending information to and from your brain, as well as relay neurons connecting up the different sort of tissues. But uh, a neuron is in a cell, but a nerve is made up of multiple neurons bound together in a bundle, often with connective tissue. Yeah, because there's blood and then there's it's inter sort of uh, interconnective tissue in between the, the sort of component parts. Plant cells, um, meristems are the things which produce. Um, plant cells, and you've already met meristems when you're thinking about um, your root tip squash. We well, should have met them in the root tip squash. When you're looking at an onion root tip, uh, the bit which is doing all the dividing to, for mitosis is a meristem. Yeah, so um, they can divide to produce different cells. Um, they are also responsible for producing the xylem, for example. So it's talking here about how they differentiate into tubular cells, which die and hollowed out and become lignified. That makes them waterproof and then they become xylem tissue. Yeah, so the tubular cells joining end to end to form xylem tissue. Uh, remember that xylem is dead, no cells or no cellular main component, whereas phloem does have um, cellular component. We'll look at that in a moment. Uh, leaves is a plant organ, contains xylem and phloem, as well as epidermis, palisade, mesophyll, etc. etc. Organ systems, shoots and roots are the organ systems in plants. Uh, so palisade cells are your typical plant cells. You should be familiar with the structure of plant cells by now. Tall, thin, packed with chloroplasts. Yeah, that's your typical palisade mesophyll cell. Uh, root hair cells, again, you should know all about. Long hair-like extensions, large uh, root extension to um, increase the area for absorption for water and minerals. I want to consider how water, what processes water and minerals get into the leaf by, uh, the root by. No chloroplasts, why not? Well, that's because obviously they're under the ground, so you don't need chloroplasts because they're not carrying out photosynthesis. They have to get their um, glucose from cells which are above the ground and get transported to them by the flow. Guard cells, we've mentioned in the past when we've talked about uh, water movement. Um, the guard cells found on the undersurface, they contain stomata, yeah, or they surround the stomata. The guard cells can swell up to open the stomata or relax uh, and lose water and become flaccid uh, and then the stomata closes so the plant can control the amount of water it loses or gains. Um, and then we've got sort of xylem and phloem tissues which obviously are groups of these uh, cells which we've talked about already. Um, cambium is the, the substance that contains the meristems which produce the xylem and phloem cells. So for example another place of where meristems are found. Uh, xylem tissue, we've mentioned already, it's lignified, it contains lignin which uh, strengthens and supports the cells um, and then you've got the long continuous tubes. Phloem tissue, sieve tubes and then these companion cells which are what we call metabolically active. We think they're responsible for pumping substances up and down the, the um, phloem. And the meristems themselves are the, are the apical tip, so the tip of the shoot. Uh, and the tip of each of the buds uh, and what we call the lateral sort of meristems so the plants can grow upwards and outwards um, and then also produce uh, new xylem and phloem tissue. Okay, a bit of a quick canter but actually that covers the key components of 
what you need to know about animal and plant cells and tissues. Enjoy. <laughs>